Flowers are mainly responsible for bringing about fertilization and seed formation. To facilitate fertilization, it is necessary that the male gametes inside the pollen grains and the female gamete inside the ovule are brought together. However, since the gametes are immotile, pollen grains have to be transferred to the stigma. This process of transfer of pollen to the stigma of a flower brought about by agents such as insects, wind and water is called pollination. Pollination can be of two types, self-pollination and cross-pollination. When pollination takes place within the same flower or between flowers of the same plant, it is known as self-pollination. In plants, self-pollination can occur either through autogamy or gaitanagamy. In autogamy, pollen is transferred from the anther to the stigma of the same flower. And is seen in cleistogamous flowers or flowers which do not open at all. Produced by plants such as viola, oxalis, Camelina and Arrakis hypogea or peanut. The anthers and stigma of these flowers lie very close to each other. When anthers dehyce, pollen grains get deposited on the stigma, which ensures the production of seed sets even in the absence of pollinators. Autogamy, however, is rare in chasmogamous flowers, which open and expose their anthers and stigma, as it requires synchrony between pollen release and stigma receptivity. In gaitanogamy, the second type of self-pollination, pollen is transferred from the anther of one flower to the stigma of another flower of the same plant. Apart from self-pollination, cross-pollination is also commonly seen in plants. This type of pollination involves the transfer of pollen grains from the flower of one plant to the stigma of the flower of another plant of the same type. This type of pollination is called xenogamy or allogamy. Interestingly, Xenogamy is the only type of pollination that brings genetically different types of pollen grains to the stigma. In both cross-pollination and self-pollination, pollinating agents play a vital role. These agents include biotic agents such as insects, birds, bees, butterflies, and mammals such as bats, as well as abiotic agents such as wind and water. Incidentally, pollination in a majority of plants is aided by biotic pollinating agents, which get attracted by flowers which vary from each other to attract their specific pollinator. Insect pollinated flowers, for instance, are usually large and fragrant. However, if they are small, they are bunched together in an inflorescence to make them conspicuous.
Moreover, these flowers produce pollen grains as well as large quantities of nectar to reward the agents. When a pollinating agent comes in contact with the anther, its body gets covered in a coat of sticky pollen grains. When the agent sits on another flower to suck the nectar, the pollen present on their bodies comes into contact with the stigma, thus completing the process of pollination. Conversely, flowers pollinated by butterflies are usually lightly scented and brightly colored, with nectar not very deeply hidden, while those pollinated by beetles and flies secrete a rotten odor. Flowers pollinated by birds, on the other hand, have large odorless orange or red tubes which are rich in honey. Certain plants attract pollinating insects by offering them shelter. For instance, Amorphophallus, a six-foot tall flower, attracts pollinating insects by offering them a safe haven to lay their eggs. In the yucca plant, on the other hand, a female moth transfers the pollen of another flower to the stigma and simultaneously deposits her eggs in the locule of the flower's ovary. The larvae, which hatch out of the eggs, start consuming some of the developing seeds while leaving enough of them to propagate the plant. Thus, both the moth and the plant are dependent on each other for the completion of their respective life cycles. However, certain birds and insects such as the bumblebee visit flowers for nectar and pollen but don't bring about pollination. These creatures are referred to as pollen robbers. Honeybees as well as other insects also pollinate a large number of aquatic flowering plants such as the freshwater lily. However, in certain freshwater plants such as Vallisneria and Hydrilla and marine sea grasses such as Zostera, pollination occurs by water. This is also known as hydrophily. In Vallisneria, for example, the female plant produces a long-stalked female flower that reaches the surface of the water. The male plant, on the other hand, remains submerged in water where it produces several tiny floral buds. Upon maturing, the buds rise to the water's surface and open up to expose the anthers. Pollen released from the anthers is carried by water currents where some of them eventually come in contact with the stigma. In the case of Zostera, a dioecious seagrass, the male and female flowers remain submerged in water. The male flowers produce long and ribbon-like pollen grains which have a, a mucilaginous covering that protects them from getting wet. The pollen released in water is carried by water currents towards the submerged stigma and thus pollination is completed. Surprisingly, in aquatic plants, wind pollination, also called anemophily, is more widespread than water pollination. Wind pollination also occurs in terrestrial plants such as grass, bamboo, coconut, and maize. These plants possess a compact inflorescence 
with well exposed stamens that allow easy dispersal of pollen and a large feathery pistil which makes it easy to trap pollen. The pollen, which is light and non-sticky, is produced in large quantities. A single flower of cannabis, for instance, produces 5 lakh pollen grains to compensate the loss of pollen associated with wind pollination. Thus, wind, water, as well as biotic pollinating agents, bring about pollination. An important process that ultimately leads to fertilization and the production of seeds in plants.